Well, this morning, I want to talk to you, I want to finish up talking to you about God's purpose for us. Now, we discovered last week that God has two purposes, main purposes. Number one, He has the ultimate purpose for each and every one of us. Then He has individual purposes for our individual daily lives. I want to talk to you about the ultimate purpose that God has for our lives, and that is, according to the Scriptures, to be made and built and fashioned into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose for us. Everything that happens when we get born again, uh, all things work together, is for that molding process because God wants us to be built in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Well, we discovered last week, and we're going to finish off this week, talking about the very things that God, God has given us some things. He's given us some things. Everybody say some things. He's given us some good things, powerful things, to help us. Everybody say help us. To help us be like Jesus. We discovered that Ephesians chapter 1 is full of those things. Amen? Now this is meat. This is meat and taters for you. Praise the Lord. This is the, the Bible talks about the milk of the word. It talks about the meat of the word. Folks, this is the meat of the word. And so I want you to digest this this morning because it's going to help you to grow and understand why you're here and what God has given you and I in order that we may fulfill the destiny and the purpose, which is to be like Jesus Christ on this earth. Well, the first thing we understand is we find it in Ephesians chapter 1. We discover that there's about uh, 10 th 12 things that God has given us f that are found in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. First of all, we discover that He blessed us. Amen? He empowered us to prosper. Uh, he had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The second thing we discovered is that He chose us. He chose us. We chose to be chosen, amen? He, we accepted, we received what He gave us. I want to just reiterate that for a brief minute while I summarize the rest of these. What I mean by that, let me give you an example of that. Now, as you many of you know, uh, Jackie has this dispensation for animals, uh, stray animals, especially them little fur, furry creatures. And uh, we have one that lives in our house, and one that lives in our garage, and three that kind of meander on our back deck. Now, let me give you this example. There's one that lives in our house. Now he, formerly, we, we recently, uh, our lifetime pet had passed away, and so we were uh, without one. So we thought, well, it's time to maybe find another one, rescue another one. There was a bunch of them that she was feeding off the back uh, deck there, off the back porch. About three, or at that time four, maybe a few more, but then they suddenly we found homes for them. There was one in particular, okay, that would hang around. He would hang around. And I would open up the door, and I would, usually they would all scatter. And one night, we heard this one crying. And just crying and whining and, and, and carrying on. And her heart, not mine, of course, but her heart went out to this animal. And um, so she was concerned. This poor little animal was just afraid of the weather, this, the rain, and, and just didn't like it. Well, she opened up the door, and he ran away. So later that night, she went to bed, and I opened, I seen him, I seen them all out there. And so I opened up the door to bring the food in for the night, and I happened, because you know the possums will get it, and I happened to see, <laughs> and they make a mess, see, the, the, the cats don't, they just eat and go about their way, but them possums will make a mess, they tip it over, and they make a mess, and plus they, they carry rabies and all that kind of stuff, so we like to shoot them away. But you're all looking at me like, where does he live? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going somewhere with this. So I open up the door to bring the food in, and I seen that one, that little one, that just, my heart went out to him. And I thought, I don't want to go through this again. I said, I, I hope he runs when I open up the door like the rest of them. So I open up the door. Guess what? He didn't run. Everyone ran, but he didn't run. He was looking there. It was very sad. My heart went out to him. So you know what I did? I said, surely he won't let me get near him. He'll run when I, you know, kind of bend over and kneel down and have him come to me. He'll run. Guess what? He looked at me, kind of backed up, and he thought, eh, you seem all right. So he came up to me and started like rubbing on me, you know, and purring, and, and his tail was up and all that stuff, you know? Oh, here we go. I'm on the hook again. <laughs> so it wasn't long after that, make a long story short, we brought him in, we got him fixed and cleaned up and everything, now he's an inside cat, and he lives very sumptuously every day, as the Bible says. He lives very well, and he's got it made. Now guess what? Any one of those, we were looking to replace, you know, an inside pet. We just, one, maybe two, that's it for the house. Then, you know, we'll take care of outside ones. But those other ones would not come in. 
Still to this day, we've been feeding them for three years. They'll get close to us, but they won't let us come in, come touch them. They won't let us pick up, pick them up. The one that lives in the garage, she does, but she's too mean to bring in the house. There's a lesson in that too. She's good to us and humans, but she's mean to other ones. So she tear the little guy up. Now, see, the, I want to show you a spiritual principle with this. I haven't lost my mind this morning. I'm going somewhere with this. That little cat that now lives in our house and has it made, any one of those cats could have been where he is today. But see, we chose him, but he chose us. You see, you and I choose to be chosen. God is not, is not, does not will for any to perish, but all would come to repentance. All would be saved. But yet you're the one who warmed up to him. You're the one who accepted the invitation. You're the one who, when the door opened, said, I want him. I'm coming in. I want everything the Father has for me. Now, he loves the others. And there's various levels of Christians, I believe. Some are really hot for God. Some are just got to get out of hell card free. Amen. And, you know, but they miss the blessings. And their life could be so much better than it is. They could live in the Father's yes, house. Yes. You and I, we need to decide that I'm going to warm up to the Father. And I'm going to be the one to live in His house. That's what it means to be chosen, folks. He does not will anybody to die in their sins and go to hell. But you chose, and I chose, to do what? To accept His grace. And be, therefore, we have been chosen. He chose us and we chose him. It's a two-way street. But then the third thing he did is he predestinated us, okay? That means he had a destiny for you because in his foreknowledge he knew that you were going to be the one to come into his house and live there. So he made his plan to suitable with you involved for all throughout eternity. The, third, the fourth thing he did is he made us accepted. He accepted us. The fifth thing he did is he redeemed us. He bought us back. And then that we finished off last week discovering that he caused all wisdom and prudence, the Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 8. He caused all prudence and wisdom to abound towards us. Mm -hmm. That means that God gives us not only knowledge, but he gives us wisdom. And wisdom is supernatural ability to understand how to apply that knowledge in our mm -hmm. lives. That's the difference between somebody who has a lot of knowledge as an educated fool and somebody who knows how to use it. Has a little bit what we call common sense. God gives us wisdom and prudence. Well, this morning, I want to finish off where we left off in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, PowerPoint number 8, where it says that he has made known unto us. Ephesians 1, verse 9, here's what the word of the Lord says, that he has made known unto us all mysteries of his will. Everybody say all mysteries of his will. So let's open up our Bibles and let's get there this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. PowerPoint number eight. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Okay? Now, you're going to have to look up your Bibles, do it the old-fashioned way, I guess. We're having technical difficulties. But he has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasures which he has purposed in himself. What does that mean? Well, listen, how do we know what the will of God is? Did you ever ask that for yourself? How do you know what God's will is for your life? Well, so many people believe that they know what God's will is for their life. And they blame everything on the will of God. You know, all things happen for a reason. We talked about this a little bit last week. I want to springboard off that. All things happen for a reason, Pastor. Yes, sometimes the reason is you made a bad decision and a bad choice. And you've got to suffer the consequence for it. Amen? Absolutely. That's right. If you plant a seed, you're going to get a harvest. Yes. If you sow to the flesh, which is corruption, adultery, fornication, uh, deceitfulness, lying, you're going to reap a harvest of the consequences of those choices that you make. But if you sow to the spirit of righteousness... And make good choices and godly choices in your, in your relationship with God and your relationship with others. You will reap a good harvest. Amen. I heard the story of a lady one day that she wasn't married. She took a pregnancy test and it was positive. And she said, the devil is a liar. I heard a preacher say he was refer referring to the story. It stuck with me. I love it. He said, it's not the devil, honey. It's Leroy. <laughs> Another lady pulls up to the ATM machine. She pulls out her receipt and she sees a negative balance. She walks around the car. 
talking in tongues, rebuking the devil. Oh, I know the devil is a liar. Guess what, honey? Again, it's not the devil. It's Nail City. It's Walmart. It's the mall. Amen? It's Pizza Hut. Hey, you didn't pay your bills. You made the choice to overdraft your account. Of course. Huh? But we blame everything. And, and society does too. If we have a tornado, if we have a terrible disaster, oh, it was an act of God. Listen, we got to quit putting God in a league with the wicked. God is not in a league with the wicked. God is righteous. God is good. God is light. Sometimes life happens. Sometimes disasters take place. Sometimes storms happen. Amen? Sometimes life just happens and sometimes it is evil that, that does take place. But we've got to understand that as people of God, He has given us the ability to understand the mystery of His will. Because how do we do that? How do we know what the will of God is? You know what the will of God is based upon His Word, the Bible. God will never act outside of the guidelines of His Bible. Amen? Amen? That's why when people say that madmen and, and women or people that have gone off the deep end and they've murdered people and they said that God told them to do it. Boy, that's so far from the truth. They don't know the will of God. Because what's God's word say? Thou shalt not kill. Really, thou shalt not murder in cold blood. Well, pastor, I went off the war. I, I, I served my country. I know that I killed for my country. That's different. Because God told His people, especially in the Old Testament, sent them off into war and commanded them to kill. There's a difference between killing for defend your family, defend yourself, defend your, your, your nation, and cold-blooded murder. Amen. So when somebody comes in and they do cold-blooded murder, it was not God. Folks, it's not God. It's, it's, it's the devil or your flesh is what it is because you don't know the will of God because if you did, you would know that one of the Ten Commandments, which is in the Word of God, says thou shalt not kill. Right. Well, and you know, I've been having a hard marriage, a hard time, and, and you know what? God sent me this woman into my life. And oh, she's everything I could ever ask for. I thank God. I've actually heard people say this. I thank God for her. That's not God's will. How do I know that? Because the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah. We know the will of God by the word of God. Yeah. God will never violate his word. That's how you know the will of God. Amen. But what about the gray areas? What about them little areas like, should I take job A or job B? Should I marry Billy or should I marry Dave? Well, Dave and Billy are both good Christians. They're both good men of God. They love the Lord. Single woman says, you know what? I've got two opportunities here. What should I do? You know what? I don't know. But God does. God knows which one he has for you. And what you need to do is you need to pray. Oh, that's too simple. I want answers, Pastor. <laughs> Come on. Pray. The Bible says, let the peace of God rule your heart. Let God's peace be your umpire. You know, in a baseball game, the umpire stands back there and, and determines whether it's a, a strike, whether it's a ball, whether it's foul ball, whether it's fair ball. The peace of God will rule your heart and guide you and be an umpire. Amen. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your flesh because both will deceive you. Follow your yes, spirit. Yes, yes. Get in tune with your spirit. And that comes through prayer. That comes through seeking God. That comes, number one, through reading the word every day. Because if you don't know what the word says, how are you going to know what God's will is? And until you, you know, and come to church, hear the word. Listen to as much teaching and preaching, good preaching and teaching as you can. Read the word of God. Ask others in, in the body of Christ that have been there longer than you uh, some advice and listen to it. So read the word of God. Pray. Pray and learn to just more than just speak when you pray, but have a time when you're quiet before the Lord. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be what? Mm -hmm. The Bible says, speak all things in truth. Yes. Right? And it also says, be kind-hearted one to another. Yes. That's the word of the Lord. But it also says this, that we should listen more than we speak. We should be slow to speak and quick to hear. Yes. And that includes with the Father in your relationship with Him. See, we need to listen to what He wants. And God will give us the peace whether you take this job, or whether you marry this person, if all things being equal. Because God knows, well, what's the difference, Pastor? Well, if I take that other job, does that mean I'm going to go to hell? Does that mean my whole life's going to... No, that's not what that means. There's the perfect will of God. There's, a, there's the acceptable will of God. There's different variations of the... But I want to be in the perfect will of God, don't you? Because that's where the greatest... Blessing is. That's where God can use my life more, ultimately. 
So the perfect will of God is for us to base it on the word of God, every choice we make, and also to hear and let peace be our umpire. Because guess what? Job A might have a little bit higher pay and a little bit better benefits, but guess what? God knows you'll be miserable there because the boss is a raging buffoon. Amen? Or it's a closed door. Or guess what? In two years, they're moving to Mexico. But you might, he might direct you to take the other job, even though it's a couple dollars less. I got a peace about this. I got a peace about this. But see, when we don't live in the spirit, we live in the flesh and we live carnal and we can't make those decisions. Amen? How many opportunities has God given us that he wanted us to go into a place to witness to somebody? He wanted to go into to testify or to minister to somebody. But, you know, we, we don't hear, we don't listen, we don't take the time, so we drive on by it. Let me give you an example. There was a woman who was in a, 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 a clerk in a convenience store, and she was miserable, and she was ready to kill herself one day. And she prayed. She goes, I'm going to try this thing one more time. And she said, Father, if you're really up there and if you really exist, bring somebody in to my shop and have them do somersaults, backflips, and stand on their head against the cooler. And I'll know that you really love me. Well, this guy was driving by. He was a Christian, and he was also an acrobat. And he loved the Lord. True story. Heard it from his own lips. And he was driving along, and all of a sudden, the Lord moved on his heart and said, I want you to go into that convenience store, bust through the doors, doing backflips, and stand on your head against the cooler. You're crazy, God. That can't be the Lord. Devil, I rebuke you. Sha -da 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 -da. I rebuke you. It's no way, no way, no way. Guess what happened? The Lord kept moving on his heart. Come on, come on. Now, there's a guy who's in touch with the Holy Spirit. There's a guy who probably reads the Word every day. There's a guy who prays. There's a guy who listens. There's a guy who's walking and stepping with the Father. So he finally did it. He said, okay, I guess you got your reasons. I've done crazier things for less. Here we go. So boom, boom, boom. He flips through the door and he's doing somersaults and he lands against the freezer and he's doing a, a, a handstand. He looks up and the lady behind the counter is just bawling. She's just tearing up, crying. And she's, oh. And so he gets up and he says, ma'am, can I help you? And she laughs and she goes, that's what I'm supposed to say to you. <laughs> can I help you? But she told him this story. She told him the story. Well, he led her to Jesus Christ that day, amen? And guess what? Her life changed. She was born again. She had a liberal understanding of God in a liberal sense, but she didn't understand what it meant to be saved. Amen. Huh? That's why we got to be in tune and understand the mysteries of His will according to what? According to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself. What, now, what is God's will? Pleasure. What, what pleasures God? What pleases God? But that, I want to challenge you to get into this, the Bible, go home and do a word study, and a, get a good concordance, and, and look up the word please or pleasure. Whatever, and, and connect it to what pleases God, what gives Him pleasure. And on, then connect also the will of God. Go home and do a word study on the will, the will of God. Understand what God's will is, what pleases Him, what brings Him pleasure. Amen? I'll tell you, in a nutshell... For the sake of this message, what, what pleases God? The death of His saints pleases God. Why? Because that means it's an arrival of us into heaven. Not too early, not too late. But it pleases God. But He takes no pleasure in the falling and, and the, the, the downfall of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in that. So here's what God, what pleases God when souls get saved. When people are born again. So that's why the Bible says that when you lead somebody to him and one sinner repents, all of heaven has a party and rejoices, Jesus said. Amen? So that pleases God. He that wins souls is what? Is wise. So go out and win some souls. Go out and win some souls. Go out and talk to some people about Jesus Christ. Share the word. If nothing else, give them a gospel track and pray and believe. Praise God. His word will not return void. But here's the thing. So we have to understand that he has made known unto us the mystery of his will because it is a mystery. There are some times there's what is spelled out in the Bible. It's not a mystery. 
Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. That's pretty simple. It's, it's, the Bible says in the book of James, above all, uh, in the book of John, above all, I wish that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. It's not God's will that any goes to hell. It's not God's will that you live sick. It's not God's will that you live in lack and poverty. It's not God's will that you live with a heavy, broken heart. It's not God's will for you to be demon-possessed. It is God's will for you to be saved, sanctified, filled with His Holy Ghost, full of freedom from sickness and disease, freedom from bondage, and to, and to live free and to be a witness on this earth, a carrier of His Word and His Gospel, and to be a light to the lost. That's what God's will is for you. And ultimately, it is to be just like Jesus Christ who did all those things and operated in all that that I just mentioned to you. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. All right. So then he made, us, uh, he, he made known the wisdom and the mystery of his will unto us. And then guess what? He's given us an inheritance. We talked a little bit about this. I'm going to talk a little deeper, very briefly. Verse 11 and 14. In whom also you have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his what? His will, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. So, let's talk about what an inheritance is. When you are wealthy, you leave an inheritance to your children. In the Hebrew culture, they, leave, they are so wealthy, they don't have to wait till they die to leave it to their kids. In fact, for the sake in this country of estate taxes, they leave it to their kids before they die. If, but they base that, whether they're going to leave that to their kids, they base it upon the maturity of the child. I'll tell you this example. Up in Ohio, there's Jacobs, the, the Jacobs family, Hebrews, very wealthy. Jacobs Field, they make most of their money through expediting. They are Jews, they are wealthy. But when it came time for them to retire and divvy everything up, they put people who were not their children, from what I understand, in charge of the businesses. And they put the inheritance in a trust for their adult children who were in their 50s and 60s and 40s because they felt those children would just run it all into the ground. So the businesses went to people even outside of their family to run that they did not even, was not even related to. And the inheritance went into a trust which was regulated by people they trusted to divvy it out to the children until the children proved that they could handle the inheritance. Want to know why maybe we're not being blessed the way we would like to? Want to know why we're not being blessed the way brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is? Why don't I get those blessings? Why don't God do that for me? God would love to do that for you. But that is based upon your maturity level. God will not place you, you've heard me say, God will not place you where your character cannot keep you. Amen? So God knows you better than you know you, so He's going to give you your inheritance a little bit at a time, the authority that you need, the blessing that you need, the power that you need, as He sees you, your integrity start to grow, your character start to grow, and whether or not you're a good boy or a bad boy, a good girl or a bad girl, it's the same principle that we as earthly parents use in regards to our children. Does not the Word of God say, does not the Word of God say that if your Father in heaven, which of you being a father, an earthly father, when his child asked for a loaf of bread, would give him a snake or a scorpion? You wouldn't do that. And you're an earthly father full of evil. How much more would your heavenly Father who is in heaven being good yes. give to you yes. who ask liberally? Yes. Mm. Hmm? God wants to bless you. God wants to promote you. God wants to use you. There's people probably at the sound of my voice who were called into the ministry that had God had purposed for them to be big in ministry, to be used mightily. But they would not answer the call, did not answer the call. Or if they did, it was for a short time and they quit. They gave up. They got offended. They got mad. And God could never use their life. You know, some people, and especially in this part of the country, do not like the idea that we have women stand behind the pulpit and preach. 
We even know the Bible says that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall yes, prophesy. Yes, yes. Yes. Have dreams and visions and the gifts in operation. Yes. Catherine Kuhlman, whether you like her or not, I don't care. But she said this. She took a lot of heat in the 60s and 70s for being a healing evangelist mm -hmm. in a day and age with chauvinistic Christianity. Yes. And she got to the Lord and she said, Father, she said, why did you call me? Isn't there a man that could have done this? He said, Catherine, I went through 17 men that I couldn't get off the bottle, out of the porno. I couldn't get them to obey me. I couldn't get them to listen. I couldn't get them to surrender. Yeah, you were my 17th choice, honey. Now, <laughs> that makes you feel good, doesn't it? Listen, I'm here to tell you, if God can't find a man to do something, he'll use a boy, he'll use a goat, he'll use a donkey like he did with Balaam. He'll use whatever woman. He'll, no offense. He'll use anything and everything he can to find a willing vessel to stand up. There's about 50 to 100 people that should be here this morning. And they're not. And he can't trust them in the little things to even come to church and, and, and be filled in your spirit. And all you've got to do is sit and receive. How in the world is he going to trust you with an international Amen. ministry? Amen. Or how in the world is he going to trust you with riches to sow into the kingdom? Right. If he can't trust you with a dime or a dollar to give into the church. Hmm. Look at your neighbor and say, ouch. So, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Aren't you glad that you're, you got an inheritance? Because we've been predestined according to the purpose of who? Of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. See, God has a will for your life. Most people don't find it. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and say, he's in the groove now. <laughs> Most people don't find it because they're too busy imposing their will on God. Amen. This is what I want for my life. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a, in business. I want to be this. I want to be that. You know, one of our presidents, former presidents, was called at a young age, I won't tell you which one, to be a Baptist preacher. A minister but chose to go off into politics more money more prestige more power more everything from his own lips I heard this he met President Kennedy at a boys thing and that was it and according to him his own acclamation he forsook the call of the Lord do I believe that well when you hear this fellow speak sounds a little bit like a southern preacher very gifted orator. Dynamic leadership skills. I'm not judging. i got enough judging to worry about with me. But I'm here to tell you, if that's true, how many, the Bible says, notice God doesn't call many great. Notice God doesn't call many mighty. Notice he calls the weak, puny, the weak, the uneducated, the foolish things of this world to do his will. Why does, why does he do that? Because the rest of that verse goes on to say that he confuses and confounds the wise. Well, you mean that Smith Wigglesworth with the sixth grade education is raising the dead, preaching the gospel? Yeah, he was a drunk. Yeah. Because the mighty and the great and the polished and the articulate and the educated, they want to impose their will on God versus surrendering to God's will for their life. And I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how great your title is. I don't care how much prestige you have. I don't care how much worldly, earthly power you ever obtain. If you are not in the un uh, unadulterated, perfect will of God for your life, you'll never be happy. You'll never be completely content. Oh, you'll have some happiness here and there. But you'll never have the joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that the Mother Teresas of this world and the missionaries and even the, the preachers in our pulpits here in America who at one particular time had what I call the dark night of the soul where they surrendered their will to God's will. See, this is what it means in verse 11 that we've obtained an inheritance and we've been predestinated according to the purpose of Him who works all things after the counsel of His own will. When you say no in those moments, now He'll give you another opportunity to say yes. Another opportunity to say yes. Another opportunity to say yes. But when you get to that place 
where you have finally said no. The Bible says, now the translation in English says this. It says it's a fool that says no to God. You know why it's a fool? Because anything he has for you, my brothers and sisters, is better than anything you could ever ask for yourself. Yeah. Notice what it says, that he works this inheritance. He predestinates you according to his purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his his own, whose own will, God's will. When you get to that point where you finally said enough is enough, no, 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 eventually the Holy Spirit says, okay. He turns you over. Sometimes to the, the wicked, he turns them over to a reprobate mind. To his children, he says, okay. Yeah, you're still, I, I mean, I'm assuming you're still going to heaven. Yeah, you know what? Here's your get out of hell free card. You just sit there and irritate your pastor. Yeah, yeah, you know, because you really have a great call and you, you no wonder why everything annoys you because you got put in you, you know. You know, putting you to do what your pastor is doing or what some missionary is doing. He ain't doing it right. Well, how do you know he's not doing it right? The average person don't know he's not doing it right. You know he's not doing it right because God put those giftings in you. Amen. But you sat on him. Uh -huh. And so what happens is he leaves you alone. He leaves you alone. Go do your thing. And there's a little bit of blessing in that. But not what it could be. Not what it could be. Because you've imposed your will instead of his will. I remember the night I surrendered to the will of God for my life. I was the youngest of five. We were poor. We couldn't afford the O or the R. We were just poor. And you know what? My father died when I was 15. When he was living, we were the working poor. None of us would have uh, been able to get grants for college. But when he died, it was a different story. Now I could go to school for free. And don't you think my family didn't push me in, into that? And, and I, I knew it was a free ticket, man. It's a ticket, man. The government, they're going to pay my education. I'm gone. Even though I, was, I graduated high school with a 1.8. Mainly because I didn't show up for class. But you know what? Here's the thing. And I finally got saved and my head was clear and I quit drinking. I quit living. I started living for God and my grades started going up and I'm in college and I said, you know what? I want to be a teacher. I want to be a teacher and I want to coach. That's what I want to be. I want to be an educator. And you know what? And God kept calling me, calling me to the ministry. No, I got a purpose for you. He gently calls. He don't force. The devil forces. The devil drives. God gently called me to the ministry and kept wooing me. Wouldn't let me sleep. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. You know, when you're in your 20s, you're consumed with what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Or you, you should be. You're either consumed with, okay, I'm going to get my next pill, or you're consumed with what am I going to get do with the rest of my life? Right? And you know what? I was consumed at that point with what was I going to do with the rest of my life? And I had a plan. I had a vision. I've always been pretty ambitious. And, but guess what? One night, and here's what it is. I bargained with God. I, I said, I'll go to a Christian college. There's a Christian college in neighboring town. I'll commute. I'll go there, and I'll study education, and I'll minor. That's back in the days when you could minor. I don't think they still minor anymore. But I, I'll minor in religion. That's what I'll do. In fact, I might even be a teacher in a Christian school. How about that, Lord? Cool? Cool? We good? We good. I thought God sitting up there. When you're ready. When you're ready. And he and he every message I would hear on the radio was about surrendering to the call of God in your life. Surrendering to his will. Surrendering to his purpose. Because he calls and he calls and he calls. Finally, one night I had enough of it. And I rolled out of my bed. And I said, okay, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you want, I'll do. And I surrendered to I I laid my will down. And I surrendered to his will. And guess what? I got on the plan. And I started stepping on the road with the Lord. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Now, verse 14 says, This is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Believe it or not, I'm almost done. But I want to give you this right here. So we have an inheritance. Okay? And God gave us a down payment on that inheritance. Because here's what happens. We don't inherit the whole enchilada until we get out of the skin and end up in heaven. Then I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, the heart of man hath cannot even imagine what waits for us, the Bible says. That's talking about the fullness of the kingdom. That's talking about the glory of heaven. 
I'll never forget, I was in a meeting one time, and uh, there was a, a minister, an international minister that was there. And he called this young man out, brought him up on the platform, and prophesied over him, and said, before your next birthday, you will see God in His fullness. That was Saturday. Monday morning, the man drove a truck. A young man drove a truck, a rental, a big old rental truck that would unload appliances in people's homes. And he pulled out on a major highway, didn't see it, pulled out in front of a semi. Boom! T-boned him, him, and guess what? The next thing he opened his eyes and he saw God in his fullness. He's in heaven today. I don't understand why. I believe that God gives us long life till we're satisfied. But you know what? God is sovereign. And that man did see God in his fullness. See, don't get so focused on this blessing here and this promotion here. It's important. Or this ministry being used in ministry this way. Don't get so earthly minded that you forget about the ultimate inheritance, which is heaven, folks. A place of glory of God. A place of no torment, no pain, no sorrow, no divorce, no physical fighting and affliction in your bodies. Yes. You don't have to fight the good fight of faith anymore. You'll be in the presence of God. Oh, but don't check out on me too early. But I want you to understand that that is the greatest inheritance that we could have is to be, is to be in heaven with God the Father. But listen, everything that we have here right now is a down payment to the greater blessing that God is about to give us. And how does he do that? Well, verse 13 says this. In whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See, verse 13 goes somewhere between verse 11 and verse 14. I didn't get that far in college. Amen. So verse 13, verse 11 and, and, and 14 talks about what? It talks about the inheritance that God gives us. It talks about being predestinated. But guess what? Verse 14, then, then talk, but verse 13 talks about us being sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that is a down payment. Let me explain to you what that word sealed means. Now, this is another thing that God does for us. He seals us. Okay? Now, when you think of a seal, what do you think of? Do you think of that cute little whiskery thing that comes out of the water? Or, 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 or. No, that's not the seal it's talking about. See, you're going to do that kind of stuff in these kind of teachings that are to keep you alive and keep you awake. Amen? But see, here's what that seal, here's what it talks about, the seal. There's four ways, there's four things, there's four ways that we're sealed according to the Bible. Now write these scriptures down because I don't have time to go into them, but I want you to study them. The first thing is that we're sealed for security. Okay? That's found in Matthew chapter 27, verse 66. That's found in Revelation 20, verse, thir uh, verse 3. Now what that means is this. How many of you know that there's some folks in here that have some valuable possessions, whether it's artillery, whether it's guns, whether it's money, whatever it is, you put that, or a bank, a bank has tons of money. Fort Knox has lots of gold. How many of you know that they seal that up? They seal that up, why? For security. God has sealed you and I this is what he's done according to Ephesians 1. If you're a believer, he has sealed us. Those people that gave their lives up in Washington were meant to be martyrs. How do I know that? That was not an accident. Because if your time is not up and you're not intended to be a martyr, you are not going out of here because God is greater than any devil in your life. You are not going out of here until your last day has been accounted for. Especially if you're in the will of God. And you're a player on his stage. And you're a key person in his kingdom. You're not going out. The apostle Paul wanted to go home, man. He knew it. But he, he was brought back from the dead. Why? Because it wasn't his time. Huh? John the Beloved, man. He's the, he's the disciple that Jesus loved. And guess what? He penned the book of Revelation. The Bible, the, the word we understand from history that he was the only disciple that was not martyred. He died a natural death as an elderly man on the island, island of Patmos. He was, his eyes were plucked out. They tried to boil him in hot, in hot oil. He would not die. 
and they shipwrecked him on the island of Patmos because God had a purpose for him, took him out of his flesh and into heaven and showed him the things that were to come. And he penned everything, a blind man penned everything that he saw. Isn't that amazing how God would use a blind man to see things? But in his spiritual element, he saw things in heaven that were to come. He's seen this, us today and what we're, what's happening in the Middle East and all this stuff that's coming to pass. And he wrote it. Why couldn't they kill him? Because he was sealed. He was sealed. Somebody puts a gun in your face and says, are you a Christian? If you are, I'm going to kill you. Say, I am a Christian. And I'm not afraid to die. But I rebuke that weapon. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No kingdom raised against me shall stand. Amen. I bind that artillery. And you know what? One of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to jam up like it did on Jim Spears when they tried to kill him years ago because he's sealed and God had a purpose for him and it was not his time to go out. Let him tell you the story sometime. It's amazing. Or like John Hagee, when the man walked in there, fired six shots, three went that way, three went that way. Why? These people are sealed. You've been sealed. Sealed for security purposes. One of two things is going to happen. Either that's going to happen or yes, it's going to prevail and you were meant to be a martyr. And unfortunately, we don't know if we have that spiritual gift until it's required of us. Either way, you win. Amen? Either way, you win. So, one of the seals, God seals us for our security. The second reason He seals us is to hide as the contents of a letter. Revelation 10.4. Revelation 22.10. Okay? Have you ever seen somebody have an official document? What do they do with that official document? They seal it. They hide it. There are certain things that you can't see because it's hidden, because it's official. So he hides the contents. Some of you are wondering, why is it not my God using me in a mightier way? Why am I not getting a breakthrough in, in, in my business, which is, I believe God's used me to minister in that. Why am I not being promoted in the kingdom of God? Why is it not my time? I'm here to tell you that sometimes God puts a veil on things. He puts a veil on things. He has to veil you up because if the devil knew what your true destiny was, he'd have taken you out a long time ago and caused havoc in your life that God doesn't want to be in your life. So he seals us as to conceal us. How many of you know, whether you like him or not, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes ministered in, they asked him about his overnight success. He said, it took me 15 years to have overnight success. <laughs> He said he preached, pastored a church of less than 100 people for many years, worked full-time, labored jobs, amen. He said he wore them shiny suits. What he meant by that was he didn't have the money to take them to the dry cleaners. You're not supposed to wash a suit, but they throw it in the washer, amen. And he wore them shiny suits, <laughs> amen. He would actually put the do the physical labor and the painting and the work on his own church. You may think of a man of God like that that has a... Great reach all over the world. And he, you wouldn't see him doing that now. Not now, but back in the day, it wasn't his time. He's preaching the same messages then that he's preaching today. The only difference is he was sealed until TBN discovered him and said, let's put a camera on this man around the world. Listen, listen, we've been sealed. Sometimes God veils you because it's not time for you yet. Amen? We've been sealed for security. And the third way that God seals us is to confirm or approved by testimony. John chapter 3.33, John 6.27, Romans 15.28. I said that a little fast. Let me give it to you. John 3.33, John 6.27, and Romans 15.28. This is where you have get a seal of approval, okay? This is where you get, okay, a seal of testimony. This is where God, okay, you've been veiled, and God says, now it's time. Now it's time for you to be an elder. Oh, but what about all the years that I didn't do, you know, that everybody overlooked me. I said this one. Well, guess what? You were sealed to, for security, to be protected, but you were also sealed to, to uh, hide from your enemies. You were sealed as an official doc, doc, document. You were hidden. But then when God says, okay, now, well, but I'm too old. Daniel was 80 when God used him mighty. Caleb was in his 80s when God used him mighty. God knows the number of days it takes to get you where he needs to get you. Okay? And then he... 
busts that seal open and seals you with another seal that stamps you that says approved. Any paper pushers in here? You get that done, you got to send it down the line so that the next person, the next boss can put their approval on it. Right? Right? See, that's the good thing about it. Because here's the, this is, I have a degree at home that is from a Bible college that they put a seal from the trustees of that particular Bible college. They have sealed it. It makes it official. I've got a license from the state of Ohio. See, in Tennessee, all it takes to marry somebody is an ordination. Okay? But in Ohio, everything's a little bit bigger bureaucracy. So I had to send a copy of my ordination in with $10, of course. And they give you a state license to state that I can solemnize marriages. And guess what it has on there? A seal by the state of Ohio. What's that have to do with me? What's that have to do with God? Listen, when God gets ready to use you in a mighty way, and you've matured and you're ready, now there's a seal upon you. See, let's go back to Brother Jakes. When Brother Jakes was preaching to less than 100 people, I don't believe that seal was on him. You call it a seal. I call it the anointing of God. Why is it that some preachers can preach the very same thing I preach, but all of a sudden thousands will flock to it? And, and you know what? Because God has put that seal on them. It was their time. What is the seal? The seal is of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of promise. So He seals them. And the final... The final way, the final seal is to confirm ownership. This is 2 Corinthians 1.22, Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 1.30, Revelation 7, 3 through 8. Seal of ownership. Okay? That's God saying, that one belongs to me. Hallelujah. That's why he's married to the backslider. That's why no matter how far you go. <clears throat> That's a good place to go into an altar call. No matter how far you run, no matter how far you go, his hand is not so short that he can't reach you. He's married to the backslider. I wish he would get off my back. I want to go back to sinning without all this guilt. Ain't going to happen. Why? Because you've been sealed. Because when you got saved, the Holy Spirit sealed you. And you know what he did? He sealed you with ownership. He said, that belongs to the kingdom of God. And no matter if you make your bed in the pit of hell, he'll follow you there. When you get saved, you can never have a... You're not going to have any joy anymore in sin. or outside of the will of God. Why? Stamp, you belong to him. Are you with me this morning? So in closing, number one, he blesses us. Number two, he's chosen us. Number three, He's predestinated us. Number four, He has accepted us. Number five, He has redeemed us. Number six, He abounds towards us all wisdom and prudence. And thank God, because I need it. And number seven, He makes known unto us His mystery of His will. And number eight, He gives us an inheritance. And number nine, He seals us. Stand to your feet this morning. <laughs>